My name is Tim Forsey. I'm the Energy Advisor at the University of Melbourne Energy Institute. This presentation is about our research into pumped hydro energy storage. What is it? Where can we build it? And why would we want to? Energy storage is a broad field and there are plenty of questions to ponder. What technologies are available and what future technologies are being researched? On what scale can energy storage be used? What does it have to do with renewable energy? How can we work out what is best for Australians, the people the world over, as we strive to stabilize our climate, reduce other health risks, and improve the efficiency of our economy? Well, what the University of Melbourne Energy Institute did over the past year, along with support from the engineering firm Arup, was to take a fresh look at pumped hydro to see if, following a 30-year construction hiatus, pumped hydro might soon have new life in Australia especially to complement the growing penetration of the variable renewables, solar, PV, and wind. So here are the results of our research paper entitled, Opportunities for Pumped Hydro Energy Storage in Australia. When I say that pumped hydro dominates the energy storage world, well, anyone giving a presentation on pumped hydro uses the same pie chart, where pumped hydro takes up the whole pie. Pumped hydro with 140 gigawatts installed globally dwarfs all other man-made, on-purpose energy storage technologies such as batteries, compressed air, flywheels, molten salt, thermal storage, or synthetic chemicals created to store energy. Why? Because for so long, pumped hydro has been the cheapest way to store energy. First, I should describe how pumped hydro works and importantly, the key ways in which it differs from conventional hydroelectricity. Like conventional hydro, pumped hydro generates electricity, but before it does that, it stores energy by buying electricity from the grid, possibly each night when electricity is cheap and demand is low, and using that to pump water from a lower storage reservoir up 100 or more meters of elevation to an upper storage reservoir. Unlike conven conventional hydro, water does not stay in that upper reservoir for long. Water is held there for possibly only a few hours until electricity market price signals indicate there is money to be made by letting that water back down the hill through a turbine generating electricity, with the water then ending up stored in the lower reservoir for reuse over and over again in the coming days. So with pumped hydro, I'm not talking about statically storing a lot of water for months or years, and so neither are we talking about big dams. Since we are using water over and over again, Pumped hydro doesn't need or depend on a large or continuous supply of water. Sure, at the very start of the project, water must be found to fill up one of the dams, and later, water loss to evaporation or leakage must also be replaced. But you don't need any more water than that. I shall come back to these important differences between pumped hydro and conventional hydro later. The first pumped hydro facilities were built in the 1890s in Europe, but pumped hydro became big in the 1960s and 1970s. Why? Because back then a new energy source had arrived on the scene that needed a storage partner and that new energy storage, that new energy source was nuclear. The first nuclear plants were truly baseload devices. You got them running and then set electricity production at a constant rate. Some of the pumped hydro facilities built around the world back then to complement nuclear are, just like your average nuclear plant, enormous. The three gigawatt Bath County unit in Virginia is said to be the world's biggest battery. In Australia, there are three large-scale pumped hydro facilities already. Tumut in the Snowy Mountains is our largest at 600 megawatts. Shoalhaven, shown here in this slide, also in New South Wales, and Wyvernhoe in Queensland. Because decades ago in Australia and elsewhere, it was found that pumped hydro could also add flexibility to electricity supply systems dominated by coal. And as done at these three Australian facilities, pumped hydro is often integrated with conventional hydro, making the profit of it, profitability of these conventional hydro facilities less constrained by droughts or irrigation demands. But after all these years, are these Australian pumped hydro plants being used? To check, we downloaded electricity production data for the Shoalhaven facility. And we saw this behavior shown on this slide, for example, during June 2011. The red line shows the day-to-day -day fluctuations of wholesale electricity prices in New South Wales. At night, electricity is generally cheaper than it is during the day, and on this chart, by as much as a factor of four or more. We see that electricity prices during this period tracked around a base level of about $25 per megawatt hour, but occasionally spiked up 
to $100 per megawatt hour. The blue lines show electricity production from Shoalhaven that often matches these red price spikes. Shoalhaven pumps up water overnight and then lets it down and generates electricity during the day in order to make money from what is known as market arbitrage, buying low and selling high. So yes, this shows that pumped hydro facilities in Australia are used. Next in our research, similar to what others have done in the literature for America, we built a computer model to represent a pumped hydro plant and loaded it up with historical Australian electricity price data. This chart shows some output from that model. This top red line shows the wholesale electricity prices over the course of 24 hours in South Australia. Similar to what we saw before, at Shoalhaven, prices start off low, below $50 per megawatt hour, and then climb to a high of over $150 per megawatt hour before falling again. In response to that, our pumped hydro model buys electricity to pump water and fill the upper reservoir overnight. That water is held for just a few hours and then once electricity price has risen, water is discharged to generate electricity. The black line down the bottom shows the cumulative cash flow over this day. For a while we are cash negative as we buy electricity to pump water, but then we cover those costs and make some profits by the end of the day. In this modeling we made a lot of assumptions as modelers always do. One of these is called the small device assumption. The size of this pumped hydro system is assumed to be so small that it has no impact on market prices. However, you can imagine that if a large energy storage device were installed in a small market, it could have a tremendous dampening impact on prices, and in that case, the small device assumption would be invalid. In fact, during the heat waves last summer in southeastern Australia, wholesale electricity prices in Victoria and South Australia spiked to over $10,000 per megawatt hour, 300 times greater than a normal price. If there existed an additional very large energy storage device in Victoria or South Australia today, would we have seen such high wholesale prices? This next chart shows our modeling of eight financial years in South Australia. We call this chart the Pumped Hydro Arbitrage Value Index because it provides insight into how much money an energy storage device might have made in South Australia during these years, buying low and selling high on the wholesale market. One thing this chart shows is the economic optimum amount of storage is around six or seven hours. Having eight or nine or ten hours of storage earns no extra revenue. This makes sense because six or seven hours is longer than the duration of most electricity price spikes. But the more interesting thing is the great difference we see between the financial years. 0708 and 0910 look like good years where a storage device could have earned more than $300 for every kilowatt hour for every kilowatt of a generation capacity installed, whereas in other years the income would have been a third or a sixth of that. What caused such a difference between these years? Falling electricity demand, PV panels, the carbon tax? Actually the answer might be simpler than that. This slide reproduces the previous chart and below that is a chart from a report for South Australia by the Australian Energy Market Operator, which is also known by its acronym AEMA. This chart simply shows the number of days in Adelaide where the temperature went above 38 degrees. And sure enough, the financial years 0708 and 0910 stand above the rest. What happens with those hot days, as we experienced earlier this year, is that electricity prices spike and a pumped hydro facility could have earned a large fraction of its annual revenue over a very small number of days. If we calculated this value index for all of the states in the national electricity market in Australia, and those results are plotted here, all to the same scale. The South Australian chart you saw before appears in the center, and you can see that the largest value has traditionally been in South Australia. Tasmania had one year that stood out, financial year 0809, and this was the worst of the drought years and shows that if you normally have a good supply of conventional hydro, like they do down in Tasmania, you don't need pumped hydro. But when you don't have a good supply of water, pumped hydro would come in handy. New South Wales, you can see the very low values in recent years, likely because of declining electricity demand, excess coal generation capacity, and even lots of hydro and pumped hydro in that state, and no recent drought. This analysis gives investors an idea of the economic opportunities for large-scale energy storage serving the wholesale market. But one can seldom make investments on the basis of models that look only at history. The trick is being able to judge what the future will bring. 
And looking to the future is what AIMO did in this study published in September last year entitled Integrating Renewable Energy. It looked out to a time when the national electricity market has more than 20% renewable energy, which mostly comes from wind, and most of that wind is expected to be built in South Australia and Western Victoria. In this future 20% renewable energy scenario, AEMO described potential grid operation problems relating to system inertia, frequency control, and interconnector transfer limits that could in future result in the curtailment of wind energy if no other action is taken before then. A possible solution is pumped hydro. You see, South Australia is the place on the grid with the greatest amount of renewable energy installed today and also the place where grid constraints are projected to be of greatest concern in the future. And South Australia is also the place that today has the least amount of stored energy available in the forms of conventional hydro or pumped hydro. The dots do seem to connect. So pumped hydro potentially has economic benefits now and in the future for energy consumers by, moderating, by its moderating effect on wholesale electricity prices, for renewable energy project owners and developers, and other low-cost producers as a way to increase the value gain for energy generated during low price periods. For transmission companies as a way to defer transmission expansion and for grid operators to provide grid stability. And indeed this is happening overseas. As the world moves to greater amounts of renewable electricity, pumped hydro is resurging in China and Europe and is again being considered in Japan, Canada, California, Hawaii, and recently announced for North Carolina, and also in the desert state of Arizona. This slide shows pumped hydro in action in March this year, complementing renewables in Germany. We see electricity production in Germany during March this year. These blue shapes, each day in the morning and evening, are the contributions from pumped hydro. Pumped hydro is activated at those times to complement solar production shown in yellow. At present, Germany has seven gigawatts of pumped hydro capacity and expansion is possible to over 24 gigawatts. So that is pumped hydro today in Germany, but back in Australia, given that we stopped building pumped hydro more than 30 years ago, is it really worth looking at it again? Where would the construction of such things be allowed? To address that, I describe again how pumped hydro differs from conventional hydro. The conventional hydro familiar to Australians is found in Tasmania or perhaps the massive snowy mountain scheme in New South Wales. In Australia, a continent with variable rainfall and snowfall, conventional hydro often involves building a very big dam and reservoir. Like Lake Eucumbine in New South Wales shown here that covers an area of nearly 15,000 hectares or the Gordon Petter system in Tasmania that covers 27,000 hectares. Rainwater or melted snow, much of it earmarked for irrigation, is stored behind dams like this for months and even for years. However, large dam building comes with its societal and environmental consequences well known to people like me who have rafted the Franklin River in Tasmania. That is one reason why when you say the word hydro, pumped or otherwise, some people think it has no future on the dry continent of Australia. However, certain key differences between conventional hydro and pumped hydro mean that some of these concerns do not apply. First, the purpose of the reservoir and a dam used with conventional hydro is energy generation and possibly also irrigation, flood control, and even recreation, whereas a pumped hydro facility has one special purpose, short-term energy storage and later use. Both can have high electricity output. With conventional hydro, water is used to generate electricity only once, and it is then sent on downstream, whereas with pumped hydro, water is used over and over again on a daily basis. These different purposes mean that rather having a lake area of 20,000 hectares, a use usefully sized pumped hydro reservoir serving the Australian market would be less than one one hundredth of that size, probably not more than 100 hectares or 50 or even as little as 5 hectares. This modest need for land and water supply means that pumped hydro can be located away from rivers and streams. This leads to there being hundreds or even thousands of potential pumped hydro sites that could be built near populated areas of Australia. This style of building pumped hydro water reservoirs that are not directly located on rivers and streams is commonly done as shown at these sites in America and Europe. In rural Australia, this style of water reservoir is referred to as a turkey nest dam, where a pond is built by moving, moving earth out of the center and piling it up all around to create the dam walls. 
Given that there are potentially thousands of pumped hydro sites near the populated areas of Australia, there have been various pumped hydro mapping studies published over the last few years. This slide shows mapping of inland freshwater sites mapped by folks at the Australian National University and by Rome Consulting. But getting back to our University of Melbourne research, we focused on whether it is possible to build pumped hydro in Australia that would create no additional freshwater demand. For this, we identified the Okinawa option, which uses seawater. These photos show the 30 megawatt Yanbaru pumped hydro facility that has been operating on the coast of the Japanese island of Okinawa since 1999. It remains the only seawater pumped hydro plant in the world. In May last year, the University of Melbourne's Dr. Peter Seligman visited Yonbaru as a guest of the operator J Power. The upper pond is at an elevation 136 meters above sea level. That pond is 23 meters deep and stores 188 megawatt hours of energy, enough for this facility to run at full capacity for about six hours. Yet the upper pond is only 250 meters across and covers just five hectares. The lower pond is the Pacific Ocean. So are there coastal locations in Australia where seawater pumped hydro could be built? To test this, here at the University of Melbourne Energy Institute, we built a high-level cost model, as I quickly illustrate with these charts from our report. You're not meant to be able to interpret these charts at short notice, but we combined these cost equations with space shuttle radar topography data to map out possible pumped hydro sites in Western Victoria and in South Australia, as shown here. With this tool, we quickly scanned huge land areas and found where there might be suitable sites. Ideally, you are looking for a site with high elevation, yet near the coast. High elevation means you can get more energy out of a cubic meter of stored water, but the site of the upper reservoir must be near the sea so that you don't have to spend too much money on longer connecting pipes and tunnels that are needed to get that water in and out of the sea. Our model ranks sites based solely on costs. Further research must take into account factors such as competing land use constraints, seawater quality, geotechnical integrity, and also proximity to electricity generators, users, and transmission lines. If you're not familiar with the land along the coast of Western Victoria, Victoria or South Australia that we mapped, here is a view produced from Google Earth. At this location on the Fleurieu Peninsula in South Australia, the land rises to a suitable elevation not far from the coast. Here, potential pumped hydro sites just happen to be located near an existing wind farm. I mentioned we used a costing model, and this next slide shows some example costs. So, is the University of Melbourne Energy Institute able to say if seawater pumped hydro can be built in Australia at an economically viable cost? Our view is that it would be worth going to the next stage of investigation, a pre-feasibility study, where we would narrow down sites and gather more real-world construction cost data. But we don't expect the cost to pump to build pumped hydro in Australia would be vastly different to what is already being pursued overseas. To conclude, the University of Melbourne Energy Institute is engaging with stakeholders that would like to further examine the potential of pumped hydro energy storage. Thank you.